We are ready for the last session. And the first speaker is Enric Boancera from MIT. Enric, take it away. Hi, can you hear me? Good. Thanks so much for having me here. And it's been great. Like, uh, I can understand that it's the last session, so please bear with me. Like, I know you're probably tired at this point, but it's the last one. OK, so um, thanks for coming. I'm going to talk about the staircase property and the leap complexity, which despite the name is uh, about neural networks. Uh, and this is work with my really wonderful co-authors, Emmanuel and Theodore, especially for the last, the last two works, which are what I'm going to be focusing on. And then the initial explorations were with, with Matt, with Guy, Serge, and Emmanuel. So we know that deep learning works. Right? That's why we were studying it. But, uh, and why does it work? Because we have some neural network architecture. We're training it with some optimizer, and we have some structure in the data. So this suggests the theoretical problem. Given some structure in the data, can we characterize when an SGD trained neural network will learn? And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. And what's the structure in the data? We're going to assume that the target function is multi-indexed. So I'll tell you what this means. We're going to first see that classical learning algorithms, so kernel algorithms, need a number of samples, which is, uh, depends on the degree of this multi-index function. And then we're going to see that uh, deep learning can solve, and we argue uh, the complexity of deep learning is characterized by a quantity called the leap of the function, which is going to be much smaller than this degree. And so deep learning is going to beat out like these uh, classical methods. And I'll define these terms, multi-index degree and leap, as we get along. So uh, it's a very basic setting. We have data samples x i y i, where x i is an R D, and y i is an R. These are the labels. And for the purpose of this talk, uh, we're going to consider x i, which are uniform in the binary hypercube. Um, you can also do this for Gaussian. You should see our paper, and I can say more about this if you have questions. But this is easier for like the notation. Um, and, but, but, but the assumption that the data is isotropic, so all of the coordinates are kind of uh, uh, drawn from the sum IID distribution is, is, is important here. Um, and then the labels are going to be given by some target function f star, and we have some noise, which is uh, zero mean. Okay? So what's the main assumption we're making? that the target function is multi-indexed. Okay, so we have our target function f star is going to be equal to h star on some subset of the coordinates, i1 through ip, where that subset of the coordinates is unknown. So h star is a function that depends only on p coordinates. Uh, it's also unknown. And those p coordinates uh, are, are unknown. So there's like d choose p choices for these coordinates. Okay, we should think of p as being order one. So the, fun the function f star depends on a small number of the coordinates of its input, and the, uh, but the in input dimension grows. I'll give you some examples, and you can ask some questions. So these are some whimsical examples I, I came up with. And I'm not <laughs> you know, a lot of the, the assumptions are really uh, are not met in these examples, but bear with me. So <laughs> just to illustrate it. So, uh, F star of x could be you know, whether some patient with some symptoms, which you can view as a uh, vector in plus 1 minus 1 to the d. Uh, each, each coordinate is whether that patient has that symptom or doesn't, has a disease. And um, so you're given data, which are the, like, the symptoms of the patient and whether the patient has the disease. And it turns out that uh, the disease depends on a very small number of uh, symptoms, but you don't know which, which ones ahead of time. And so the machine learning algorithm kind of has to figure out which are the important symptoms and then fit a function. OK, or like uh, whether a person has some phenotype and it depends maybe on a small number of genes that are expressed. Okay, and uh, so maybe these are not very clarifying examples, but uh, please ask questions now about the setting because uh, this will be, if you don't understand it, because this will be kind of the, the setting of the data for this talk. It's clear? Okay. 
I was told, wait 30 seconds, make it awkward, and then somebody will always. <laughs> yeah. I was going to wait. OK, so the question is, are all these multi-index functions created equal? So uh, in the question of representation by neural networks, can I find a neural network that kind of approximates a certain multi-index function? The answer is yes, because you can just, uh, you can just take the network and make it depend only on those p coordinates that matter. But you pay 2 to the p, but this is much less than like 2 to the d, which would be the cursive dimension. From the, from the point of view of generalization, the answer is also yes. You can, uh, if you take the minimum norm network uh, that fits the data, so this is kind of like minimizing the norm of the parameters but fitting your training data, then you'll avoid this cursive dimensionality. And, uh, but this is not an efficient algorithm because you can't, it's like an NP-hard problem to find the minimum norm network that fits the data. And so, but in practice, uh, what are the networks, how the networks optimized? They're optimized at SGP. And so some, uh, I think it's like L2 norm of the weights, so, okay. <laughs> I, I think if you take like a, uh, what? Yes? Yeah, so I think the, if you have some, uh, like neural networks, uh, two layers that are bounded norm induce like some class of functions. Uh, I think it's called the Baron norm, or you should read the Bach paper. Uh, I, I think so, yeah. Yeah, it should be L2 norm. So if you were able to find the minimum L2 norm weight uh, function, uh, neural network, you would be able to fit the, uh, fit the data with that, that fits the data, then it would generalize. Right? Because kind of what would happen is uh, you would have zero weight on the coordinates that are not I1 through IP, that are the ones you don't know. But SGD training, so all multi-index functions are created equal, but some are more equal than others. Uh, some are significantly, easily, significantly easier to learn than others. Uh, it's an experiment you can run, and we ran. So just uh, take a, a function uh, on the binary hypercube with input dimension 30, you train with MSC, so squared loss, and if you, you know, try to train x1 uh, versus try to learn to the product of x1 through x10, which is going to be in plus 1, minus 1, because this is plus 1, minus 1 input space, you see that the loss really decreases very fast for learning x1, but it kind of gets stuck. And here I've trained it for 100 times more than the left-hand plot, uh, uh, 100 times more samples and same hyperparameters. This is like some five-layer ResNet, and it, 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 it doesn't... It didn't succeed. Uh, okay, so you can say, well, maybe what's determining what, how hard the, this function is is, uh, is is the degree of this function. But that's not uh, quite true because you can also uh, train on this function we call the staircase function. So what this staircase function looks like, I'll just write it here. I'll just expand this sum. It's a high degree function because uh, it's got, in this case, 10 terms and uh, of increasing degree with one uh, degree 10 term. But it's uh, still efficiently learned by neural networks with the same hyperparameters as in the parity case. So somehow adding these extra terms has let you uh, learn the high degree terms. So learning, adding these lower degree terms somehow mysteriously, yeah. Uh, yeah we prove it for square loss. I think, yes. Yeah, we don't have anything for non-square loss. Oh, we only ran on the square loss. So, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Actually, I haven't really thought about how to define it for the non-square loss. It's a good open question. Yeah. So, um, yeah, somehow these lower degree components are helping you learn this high degree component, which by itself is not being learned. So there's some sort of like hierarchical structure in this function, you can think about it, that you know, magically gives you this behavior, where the, where the test loss decreases. So uh, and this is for uniform on the binary hypercube inputs. Uh, OK, so the, the, what are we going to do? We're going to try to. Uh, this was the, I have the details written somewhere. 
So you get the same behavior with batch or with with mini batch, with online, with uh, you know ERM, with the fixed number of samples. The specific uh, experiment, I could tell you the details, but <laughs> no, not can't tell you the details. Okay. Yeah. So actually, here I'm plotting one over the square root of this 10 times this, so I normalize it. So the L2 norm of these is the same, and this gets to much smaller than one over square root of 10, uh, 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 one over 10 L2 norm. So, uh, so one over square root of 10 L2 norm. So because you get to zero error by Parseval's theorem, you know that you've actually like, uh, learned uh, the high degree term. Because you can write any function on the binary hypercube like, uniquely as a polynomial. So you kind of are learning all the coefficients. And I have another plot, which ah, I forgot to put in this, uh, where you <laughs> show actually, you can see actually that the Fourier coefficients associated with each of these uh, terms are, are learned kind of in order, uh, kind of. Where x1 is learned first, and then x1, x2, and so on. Okay. So this is kind of a toy setting, but it inspired these uh, like investigations. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, what, what I'm going to tell you is that why can we learn this high degree function? Because, you have a question? Uh, yeah, yeah, so if you do one pass, the train loss is equal to the test in this case because the input space is so large. If you do ERM, then the train loss goes to zero also, but I was plotting the test loss. So there's a generalization on outside of your sample. So, um, well, the number of samples you need uh, depends on the degree of the the functions as d to the degree, where d is the input dimension uh, for classical machine learning, and then uh, like kernel machine learning, and then deep learning, uh, we argue you pay d to the leap. We prove this in some cases, and there are some cases that are still conjecturally open, but we have that in there. Okay. So let's do the let's do the let's do the d to the degree first. Okay. So under the uh, so a popular tool to analyze training dynamics of neural networks is so-called NTK, and under this NTK parameterization, which is a specific parameterization of your neural network initialization, learning rate, as you take the width to infinity, you basically training with SGD or training is, as, is as powerful as using a kernel method. So anything you can do with, so there's a specific like kernel that's associated with a certain neural network initialization uh, and architecture, uh, and as the width goes to infinity, uh, SGD, on, will like mimic or will be the same as, as training with a kernel method. So this is good because it, you know, we understand kernel methods well. Actually, I'm not going to define what they are because this is not the subject of this talk. But uh, there's something where you, you can really uh, get a good grasp on how you're going to generalize. Um, but the, it's bad because uh, it doesn't capture our experiments. Our experiments. OK? So, um, it turns out, as I mentioned before, you can write any function on the binary hypercube uniquely as some polynomial where these coefficients, called the Fourier coefficients, are unique. There's two to the p of uh, these coefficients, a h hat of s, uh, each associated with one subset of the, uh, uh, of the uh, uh, inputs. Uh, and uh, so you can like, define the degree of the, you can define the degree of h star as the maximum non-zero uh, Fourier coefficients, like the maximum size of a set where the Fourier coefficient is non-zero. And it turns out that the degree of H star controls the sample complexity when you take a, uh, the NTK of a two-layer fully connected network and the NTK parameterization. And this is kind of previously known. Uh, in fact, we prove, you know, it's not very complicated, but one can prove that any kernel method needs, any kernel method, not just the one for this neural network, but any neural network you choose, the corresponding NTK will always need d to the degree samples to learn. In this setting where you, you're trying to learn f star of x, uh, and it's equal to h star of xi through xip, and you don't know i1 through ip. OK? So I, I could get into more detail about that, but I think I should move on to the meat of this talk. Any questions? I can give you an intuition. Basically, what happens is that, um, you 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 can learn if you can learn the class of um, okay so 
kind of, uh, any kernel method can only output uh, functions that are, lie within an n-dimensional subspace, where n is the number of training samples. And somehow the class of h star uh, under permutation, a uh, uh, class of f star that you can make with any 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 choice of i one through i p, that's d to the p or sorry d to the degree different possible function. Uh, sorry, d to, d to the p different possible functions, and they lie in the d. They, do, they don't lie in smaller than the d to the degree subspace. So you can't, they wouldn't lie in the kernel, uh, the subspace of classes, you, functions you can limit the kernel. Okay, anyway. <laughs> so, okay, this is the first attempt is MTK, and so you pay d to the degree. Now the, the meat is, uh, why can we do better with deep learning? And this is like kind of independent of what I've said before. So now, if you, if you zoned out, you can still come back in. Okay. So recall this experiment, parity versus staircase. So we're going to argue that uh, we're going to define this notion of leap. I'm going to say parity has a large leap and the staircase has a small leap. Okay, so let's now let's write down what the network architecture we're going to do it take is. I'm going to take a two-layer network architecture. So this is the, the first layer, is, uh, the second layer is A, and this is in R to the M, where M is the width of the architecture, and then the uh, uh, should not have drawn this. Okay, so, all right. Okay, so um, the first layer is uh, W. And the, here you apply some nonlinearity sigma. So you kind of, this is your input X. Okay, you feed it through the network architecture and uh, you apply nonlinearity sigma, then you. Uh, you add up the neurons weighted by A. Okay, so why did the why did the, the NTK analysis fail? Well, because you have isotropic initialization. So the coordinates. Uh, so so here I fixed x uh, i one through i p to be one through p since your your initialization is a permutation you know invariant. Uh, this is. Uh, you know, just as hard as learning an unknown i1 through ip. So uh, the coordinates i1 through p are not especially favored. Um, uh, each row you have, uh, uh, like for each neuron, there's an equal weight on each of the inputs. And so this kind of turns out that if we just train the second layer, we would need d to the degree samples. But so, okay, let's do a thought experiment. What if instead we initialized um, each row of your uh, first layer matrix? with uh, the first coordinates, uh, first p coordinates of order one, so much larger. And then we initialize the last coordinates of order, you know, one over root d, smaller. So now there's, now this favors like um, uh, learning functions of the first p coordinates and actually turns out that if you have such an initialization, then you can learn any function of the x1 through xp just by training the second layer. Of course, we don't have this magical initialization. We don't know what the, coordinate, the right coordinates are. So then the hypothesis is SGD works by making the neurons, so the, the weights large on these first p coordinates. So some, yeah. 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 So this would be the cat, yeah. So you just, this is a, like a heuristic intuition. So a good question. So. Uh, yeah, so we kind of uh, imagine we were to freeze W and we were just training A. This is kind of, the dynamics here are well understood. It's just a random features model. And so we can understand the generalization, uh, uh, how much, how many samples you need to generalize easily. And it turns out that if you had much, you know, su sufficiently diverse, but uh, much larger weight on the first P coordinates, then you would be able to uh, 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 learn with two to the p samples, which is much smaller than d to the degree, because remember p is constant and the d is is growing. Okay. All right. So the hypothesis is that this magical initialization is actually <laughs> being provided by uh, SGD. Uh, so there's like the uh, and this is actually so I'm going to show you an experiment now. <coughs> so this is some other function which I've plotted because it'll give you a nice plot of. You don't have to look too much at the form of this function. It just depends on the first eight coordinates. Let me show you a video. I can't do it on 
Beamer, so I'm going to switch to Keynote. This is like a very hybrid talk with the uh, Beamer and the Keynote and the, and the Blackboard. So, <laughs> okay, so what am I plotting on this, on this left-hand side, the test loss during training for this, uh, for this function? And on the right-hand side, I've plotted uh, W transpose W, where W is the first layer weight. And uh, the input dimension is 30. You know, it's just for visualization. Like, you see this effect even more if you take the larger D. Uh, and, af and, and so you have the 30 by 30 matrix here. And after training, the W transpose W is basically zero everywhere except for this eight by eight block, which corresponds to the first eight coordinates. So after training, you have uh, your, like, uh, this is just regular, it's just out of the box, the SGD uh, on this neural network. After training, you see this uh, eight by eight matrix does have the kind of the, the property. Yeah. So how many neurons uh, do you think uh, so, so for our theory, we take infinite. Uh, here, I think I took 40 neurons. I didn't take too many. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I think this is a ResNet. I'm even just plotting the first layer in all of the ResNet. So, yeah. Yeah. Here? Uh, this, this? Oh, sorry, you're looking at this screen. Sorry. Okay, this is uh, number, uh, training like step, like number of samples. So it go from zero to 500,000. And, and this is the test loss. And then this here is the W transpose W, the absolute value of the weights. So I'm gonna show you a video, it's very cool. You get a different plot. That is, you know, the theory will make it. Uh, I have an odd degree term here, so I have x one. So that's so this is kind of what you see here is the initial decrease in the loss is due to picking up x one. The initial decrease in the loss is because it learns x one, and then afterwards it plateaus for a bit while it tries to find two three four. Once it figures out two three four are important, wait the line, and, and it uh, learns. And then it plateaus while it tries to learn five, six, seven, eight. And uh, when it figures out those are important, it, it decreases again. So uh, the, the, amount, the length of the plateau will depend on the leap. So this is kind of maybe you're already starting to see the definition. So the, dif the difference between the uh, variables in each of the monomials as you pick them up sequentially. OK, so I'm going to show you a. Uh, okay. I'm going to show you a video. So here on the, so, you, so I'm, I'm, I'll play it a few times, but uh, you see uh, as the iter uh, training progresses, the uh, loss kind of decreases, and I'm plotting the evolution of the, um, the W transpose W at, at the same time. So you can see when the loss is plateaued here, it totally depends on the first four coordinates, and now it falls, and now it depends on the first eight coordinates. So you kind of see inside the weights of the matrix, that it's putting more like attention in some sense onto the uh, onto the uh, like the, the the variables that matter for the term it's trying to learn. Okay, tell me when you get bored of seeing this. <laughs> so uh, now I have the first four, and now it falls at first eight. So you can see. Yeah, you can do this with other functions. The first, now the first four, and it's when this is plateauing, and now the first eight, it falls. Okay. All right, now operation successful. I'm back here. Okay, so, uh, all right, so the observation is that you learn, the, there's phases in this learning, and each phase you have like d to the order one steps, which is large, and you're picking up some coordinates in the support, and then you have the smaller number, like it's two to the order of p, where basically if you were just training the second layer, you would be able to fit the function to the, the coordinates to which the first layer weights have already, which the first layer weights have already picked up. So the key question is, is why do the first layer weights grow in the direction of the uh, support? And uh, what governs the complexity of finding the coordinates in the support? And this, is called, this is the leap complexity, which is this, uh, so the, you have a, it'll take d to the order of, the, uh, of leap steps to, f to find 
the, that's the length of the plateau where you're trying to find the new coordinates. Any questions? And I'll go into a calculation. I tell, no, no, that's why I put in quotes. I haven't defined it. Yeah. First, to give intuition. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So you mean that space T was fixed? Yes. But in the initial equation, you also fixed the T big number T? Okay, so, so the, um, yeah, so here in my, this is a thought experiment. Are you talking about this? So this is a thought experiment. I don't actually initialize each of the rows. So this is like, if I had this, then I would be done, basically, because I could just train the second layer weights. Okay. Then the, the, the thing is that I, actually these are, this is found automatically by SGD. So this magical initialization is kind of how the dynamics proceed to, to define this. Okay. And in the you uh, isotropic. So if you look at the video, so let me pause. See, uh, here, it didn't pause fast enough, but here you have uh, x1 has been picked up already. But um, yeah, the rest is isotropic. Like, and, it, and it picks up, uh, yeah, so then it grows the first four. Yeah, OK, all right, so let's move on. Okay, good, so yeah, so we have this leap, I'm gonna define it. Okay, so, uh, so we wanna understand how training these networks uh, works, You're training the first layer with one pass SGD, uh, with some mini batch size, just for simplicity for these slides, you can do also with one, with mini batch size equals one, but you get a different limit. And so in the, uh, this is hard to understand, you have stochasticity because of the small width, or the finite width and finite sample size, but you can uh, approximate the dynamics. Um, if you take large width, many batch size, and small step size, you can approximate the dynamics by this kind of thing, where this expression where I've taken the population expectation, and I've uh, taken, uh, uh, what else have I done? And also all the neurons are kind of interacting in a mean field way. So this is kind of like what you get in the mean field, in the mean field limit. I've simplified a bit even, but. Uh, Okay, so you have some uh, expression which tells you how the first layer weights are evolving on each step. So let's give an intuitive picture. Yeah. Yeah, large. But you know, in practice, you don't need it that large. It's that you take like infinite width, but actually, it's like we okay, order one width with with large enough constant, uh, large enough constant width. It doesn't depend on the input length. It does not depend on the input length. Like uh, 100 widths, or any, it, it, it depends on the final accuracy you want to achieve in the theoretical results. So, you know, uh, yeah, but it does not depend on the. <sighs> sure, P is constant. So, yeah, yes, it depends on P actually pretty badly. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, so okay, so uh, I, you're you're like uh, actually reading it. So uh, <laughs> so here, <laughs> so um, okay for constant time of training, you can maintain this approximation as long as it's a small constant time. When you have a larger amount of time, then you also need to add in like the current. Uh, you, this this becomes the residual. Uh, but the, for what actually in the result, the result on mean field training, we first train the first layer while keeping the second fixed, and then we train the second layer while keeping the first fixed. And so we train for a um, small amount of time, the first layer, and so then this is still valid, and then the second layer, we just use the kernel analysis. Okay, so let me give you some intuition. So, okay, so I just made that picture, and now I'm looking at uh, one individual neuron, so let's say this neuron, okay? And uh, the, the weights of this neuron are going to evolve according to this formula. So what are the weights at initialization? These are, these are uh, Gaussian. And then after one step, uh, and here, okay, here I've plotted the projection to the first two, the first two coordinates, kind of the distribution of the overall neurons of the weights uh, projected to the first two coordinates. After one step, uh, you see the kind of like the, the, the coordinates in the direction one uh, grow a lot. Uh, okay, why is this? I'll give you the calculation. Uh, you want to see the calculation? 
I think you, I think you do. So, um, okay. Which one's so, gray? Makes what? Which one's gray? No, it makes it more awkward if I don't. <laughs> and I was told this is how you give a talk. I don't know. Okay, so also, yeah, this is not a one. This is my cursor. Okay, so um, what is this? Uh, what is how I'm perturbing the weight? I'm taking the step size times this expectation over x of x1, this is my target function, times uh, sigma prime of x transpose w times x. So this, is, this here is a vector. I mean, these, these are vectors. OK? This is kind of the direction of perturbation. So now let me do a Taylor expansion of the sigma prime. And uh, this is roughly the eta times the expectation of x1 times, oh, OK, uh, t, well, let's just put some constants, which are the derivative. I don't know. Uh, so OK, so, uh, okay, so, so the point is, um, this, is uh, this, is close, this is small to begin with. Um, and so we can do a Taylor expansion. This is small. This is going to be on the, uh, yeah, so, OK. This is roughly sigma prime of zero plus sigma prime prime of zero times uh, x transpose w plus sigma prime 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 of zero times x transpose w squared divided by two uh, all, all times x. Okay. So what does this expression look like? Uh, so the, this is actually going to be, it's going to depend on the coordinate. So, uh, so if I look at the, the first coordinate, which is the first coordinate of x here, this expression will be roughly the expectation over x of x1 times x1 times sigma prime of zero, which is equal to order of one, OK? And if I look at the other coordinates, which are not equal to the one coordinate, this will be the expectation of x of x1 times xi sigma prime of zero uh, times uh, plus, plus sigma prime prime of zero times uh, x transpose w plus lower order terms. And this is going to be much, much smaller than 1 because uh, this, this, this first term will cancel because the expectation of x1 times xi is 0. And then these, this term will also cancel because you have a degree 3 polynomial, x1 times xi times some degree 1 polynomial. And then this other terms are the ones that can contribute, but they're small. So this is much smaller than 1. So, uh, OK. So, uh, basically, um, the, cor the, direction, the coordinates in the direction of uh, x1 are going to move. So I should be wrapping up soon. So what happens if you do x1 times x2 instead? Same thing. I could do the same calculation. Uh, but actually, because you're x1 times x2, you're high degree parity, you're kind of going to be stuck in a saddle point. So uh, the, after one step, you still have coordinates 1 over square root of d for all the uh, first layer weights. And after any constant number of steps, you're still going to be stuck at the saddle point. So actually, it's much harder to learn. You need more than a constant number of steps. You need like log d steps. Okay? But uh, then what happens with the magic of this function x1 plus x2, x1, x2, which is the staircase? Well, the first uh, step, uh, you're the same. After one step, only the x1 term matters. So you kind of grow in the direction of x1. And after another step, the x2 term uh, can grow because the x1 term uh, actually like has has grown, so uh, you can escape the saddle. It allows you to escape the saddle when you have the w1, which is large. So after only two steps, now you've uh, you're, you're, you you basically have the order of magnitude of the coordinates that you want on all the weights. Okay. <laughs> right. So I think I have like uh, four more minutes, and then it'll be questions. So um, do you have questions now? Uh, I, I'm going to tell you what the leap is. But uh, you have questions about these calculations? Yes? Can you find the first term during the first step? The first, what? The first term? 
Yes, this this term. Okay, so uh, okay, so okay, so okay, so uh, x is uh, in plus one, minus one to the d, and this is uh, so the norm of x is equal to square root of d, and w is drawn Gaussian i d over d. So the norm of w is equal to order one. So then the dot product of this, um, x transpose w, is going to be order um, is going to be uh, order one, right? So actually, we take this initialization that's like some constant times this, so it's small. So then this is some small constant, so we can do the Taylor expansion. Yeah, we multiply for the theoretical analysis. Yeah, this is all, in practice it's all standard. So, so yeah, so you're right. You 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 got me. So this is there's some sigma there's some sigma there's some c here. Okay, it's small. Okay, all right, good. So back to this experiment. The first layer weights have grown successfully for x1 and for this staircase, but they suck at the saddle for x1 times x2. So let's go back to uh, what happens in parity and staircase. Well, somehow. The weights are stuck at this saddle, which actually of higher order here, and then they escape the saddle by climbing the staircase, so to speak, in the staircase part. We have first you learn x1, and you learn x1, x2, and so on. Okay. So now you can define the leap complexity. So again, we're writing the, the target, the function h star, we write it as a polynomial. And uh, let's consider its set of non zero co Fourier coefficients. The leap of h star is less than or equal to L if there's some ordering of these non zero Fourier coefficients such that you can kind of grow the size of the support that you haven't previously seen by most L on each iteration. Okay, it's so kind of like, uh, you can think of it as first you're gonna learn the Fourier coefficient corresponding to S1 and all of those coordinates will grow and then the ones S1 and S2 and you only really pay for the coordinates you haven't learned so far. Okay, so some examples. The parity has leap K because it's a one Fourier coefficient of order K and the uh, staircase has leap one. And this conjecture is that for any set S of non-zero Fourier coefficients, almost all H star that have those non-zero Fourier coefficients, you're gonna need D to the maximum of leap of H star minus one comma one samples. Okay, so this is a, a conjecture, and I said almost all because there are some degenerate cases we can prove, but, uh, uh, there's a measure theoretic sense in which you can define almost all. Okay, the, and also why, why, this, why this here? Because this is um, based off of the complexity of escaping the saddle point corresponding to learning that uh, uh, monomial. So this is a paper of uh, Reza and uh, uh, Ben Arus and others. So Reza is in the audience. So. Yeah. Yeah, because it's one pass, one pass SGD. So we're, so we're really like doing one, one sample per step. So yeah, for ERM, I think it's different. Also, there's some paper recently that says that if you smooth the loss, then you can actually get a slightly different bound. It's like leap over two, or like it would be leap over two. So I can talk to you about that, yeah. Yeah, okay, so. Any questions? Then I'll tell you what we proved and then, then it's over. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, you have to be careful, yeah. Yeah, so what do you do after that? You can, so you can take a small step in the first, in, in the, fir the first step can be small. So it's a small constant still. Yeah, it's still constant. It doesn't go to zero as d goes to infinity. So, so you just make sure that this Taylor expansion can always hold. Yeah, so I mean, we have no way, other way of, we don't know of any other way of analyzing first layer train dynamics because it's like nonlinear. So basically we, op we train it for very small time. So the Taylor expansion is still valid and it's like it requires some like tight analysis or some technical, like some tight analysis. But then when you go to, um, uh, but then when you train the second layer, you can train it for a lot of time, which is still constant, but it's a big constant. That it, so it doesn't grow in D, so this is, yeah. It only depends on H star, on the on, on P, really, on the number of cards. Yes? Yes? I guess this is a way you, uh, you, you need the uh, leap test to make the first one that I did. 
Yes. Yes, because of one pass. Yes. There's, I can, okay, so I have literally right here, I have an extra slide which I've copied from Keynote. Um, there is an, so we have also like some, so we, how do we prove this stuff? I haven't told you what we prove. We analyze some PDEs and we can prove that they're kind of stuck uh, in certain cases, uh, like degenerate cases, uh, and you can construct a de degenerate case, but if you perturb it slightly, then, then you, you escape. And, uh, and so we have, yeah. We don't, like, so in, in the extension to Gaussian, uh, which I didn't talk about, we don't believe that there are degenerate cases, um, but you know, we don't actually know. <laughs> so, so let me tell you what, what, we have, what progress we made on this conjecture. I copy here, I put in gray so you don't get distracted too much. So uh, the case of leap equals to one, I believe is mostly resolved. We have this paper which shows that if you take a mean field network you know, with sufficiently large, um, uh, like, like infinitely large width, uh, but really order one with doesn't depend on D is enough. And you train it for order D, order one time, which corresponds to basically order D samples. You want to play fast and loose. Uh, meaning that you can, you can order one time, you can uh, uh, simulate with order D samples, but it's not necessarily true that yeah, you, you can't do more with order D samples. We don't know that. But okay, if, if you look at the mean field networks trained in order one time, they can learn if and only if leap of H star is equal to one. Uh, and this, this is star here because of these degenerate cases. Okay, and this is, uh, this is requires using the mean field approximation, then saying because the target function depends on a small number of coordinates, you can uh, get like a PDE, which is equivalent, but which is simpler to analyze, and then you do like, uh, then you analyze it. So, and, you an and we analyze it for any P, so it's like, uh, and then we do the Chiller expansion trick. And so, yeah, uh, so, okay, so what happens with the leap more than one? Uh, this is mostly open. We do have, um, we do have CS, we can prove that, you know, this D to the, or at least order leap should be hard for CSQ algorithms. Um, and then we also have some special cases in which um, SGD can learn a family of leap staircase functions. So like basically those would be staircase functions where I remove, uh, where I'm kind of erase a coefficient. Um, uh, yeah, or, or, or remove term. Uh, and also we're, in the Gaussian case, you have Hermit polynomials of higher degree. So, um, so yeah, so the, the, this is our, yeah, this is it. Any questions? And then I'll put the summary slide. Yes. Yeah, so it's this, it's this staircase functions that look like this, except I've erased some of the terms. Uh, or, or in the Gaussian case, I have like Hermit K instead of, yeah. Uh, okay, yes. So in the paper we only do, in the ABM 23 paper, we only do Gaussian, but the same will hold for uniform on the hypercube. So I've kind of lied. One of the papers is for hypercube, the other one is for hypercube and Gaussian, but we only really show for Gaussian. So yeah, so it turns out uh, the leap, the leap. So okay, this is my summary slide. So you have to you define an isotropic leap. So you define it. It's a slight variation of the leap, which is, so you have a slightly different definition of multi-index function, where it's not some p coordinates that matter. It's some p directions of the inputs that matter. So basically, f star of x is equal to h star of m x where m is in r to the d times p, uh, p times d, okay? Uh, and that's the kind of the appropriate definition for Gaussian because it yeah, now has a symmetry. Um, and you have to define a corresponding isotropic leap which is gonna depend on the expansion of, F, of H star in the Hermite basis. So now you pay more actually for high degree Hermite even though if they only depend on one direction. And then you also, uh, uh, so that, that, that adds a complication because now you, even with one coordinate, now you have many different possible leaps. So that's the why, partly why the first paper was only for Gaussian. And it was more like rigorous. Yeah. And then this one, you know, it's rigorous, but it's only special, special setting. <laughs>
Okay, yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> In this in, in this case, but there's also I mean this is for general like you're talking about two to the p versus poly of p dependence on the samples or what? Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then you said that uh, uh, in this way you show what you do inside the GD, right? Mm, I don't know if you know you need extra structure with GD, right? So G, because otherwise you're solving an empty hard problem, like yeah, learning yeah, the, if you have the support. Uh, assuming you have the staircase. Of course, yeah. If you have the staircase, uh, I'm not sure. I don't know. We we'll can talk about. It. I'm not sure how whether it's strictly better or, or, or worse than those bounds. This is also one pass SGD. It's a slightly different setting computationally. Yeah, whether you do ERM, okay. Uh, so okay, so for the rigorous, for the for the for the leap one result, for example. Uh, okay, so you can do it for batch GD with a constant number of um, not a constant number of steps where the batches of order D, and it's independently drawn each time. So the mini batch mini, mini, mini batch SGD where order D mini batch size each time for a constant number of steps. I don't know yeah, if you can do it for the full, but maybe. So, so the main difficulty is, okay, yeah, sure, you show that the, the first, uh, the weights adapt to the uh, directions of support, but then you have to show they're still diverse. So this requires, like, uh, you have to show that some kernel is non-singular, and this is a kernel that's generated by the training dynamics. So you actually use, like, some algebraic facts to, to do this, and I don't know how this all interfaces. <laughs> it's, it's Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay, and, uh, uh, So if I'm if I understand correctly, the, gre the greedy low rank learning dynamics are generally when you have very small initialization, right? right. So this is not you know not the setting we're assuming here. So it's a different reason for the low rank to occur. Um, it's also not a degeneracy problem. It's because we can't prove that the mean field PDE is valid for those time scales, uh, for longer time scales than order one. So like the limiting dynamics, you would actually need exponential in time samples for that for those to be valid. So uh, and here we're trading for you know poly poly number steps or poly time. So you would need e to the poly dynamics uh, poly samples. So actually this this analysis is a not this for leap one more than one is not for using the mean field PDE, but it's using a, a, a martingale argument, kind of like the one in uh, in the Benarus paper and and uh, and raise us here too, I think, and um, and then we have the modification where we kind of like we, we show that this uh, you, you do go from saddle to saddle. Oh, I also I also uh, forgot to mention like this this is the the achievability result here is we train the first layer and then the second layer and then here we even cheat more so we train the first layer and the second layer and we also have like a projection down to a, like a ball kind of thing on each on each step so that just to control it so there's there's a lot to be done. <laughs> Yeah, okay. So 
Does that answer your question? I think uh, I'm probably out of time, but uh, people keep well, answering. Yeah, asking. The learn the parody? Yes, so uh, because uh, the mechanism is such that the weights grow in the direction of the relevant coordinates, uh, you can fit any function that depends on those weights used by training the second layer. So kind of after training the first layer, oh, okay. now you can train the second, the second layer in your, in your, in your so, and so you basically kind of like learn the subspace. Yeah. Okay. okay.